Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. It is lovely to be with you this morning on Sunday, 7th of April. This morning we listen to Dave Russell as he reads to us John 2, verses 1 to 11. Today's reading comes from John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, from the New International Version. Jesus changes water into wine. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 80 to 120 litres. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Faith in Action Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. If there was ever a verse that carried me through uncertain times, it was this one. When life is tough, when we are vulnerable, and when even the next hour is uncertain, such as when we take a chance on something, and there is a possibility of being rejected, or when we are experiencing difficult emotions, such as grief, anxiety, or fear, what do we do in those moments? Martin Luther said, Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. Hebrews 11 verses 1 and 3 says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Having faith is not always easy. Trusting in the Lord can be a minute-by-minute process. Today, we take a look at trust and faith through the lens of John the Apostle when he tells us about the miracle Jesus performed at the wedding in Cana, turning water into wine. John wrote the gospel with one purpose in mind, for those who hear and read the gospel, and that is for us and all generations before and after us, to know the true identity of Jesus. John the Apostle is so passionate about this objective that the whole book is written with this aim in mind. John wants us to believe in Jesus so that we can have eternal life. We read this in John 20. It says, These things are written 
so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Each chapter is carefully crafted with poetic and passionate writing and is meticulously structured to highlight Jesus as the Son of God, our Messiah. John only selects seven signs to write about. He wrote that there were many more signs, called miracles, which we can read about in the other three Gospels. John seemed to be an artistic missionary, a writer and a storyteller. I almost want to call him a researcher, but that won't be accurate as he only tells us about his lived experience of Jesus as a witness. And he writes about what he believes. The reason I want to call him a researcher is because he acts like an examiner of each event. He consults other eyewitnesses, such as John the Baptist, and he, John the Apostle, compiles evidence to answer one important question. Who is Jesus? John kind of encourages us to examine what he writes that we cannot just take his word for it. He will give evidence to what Jesus actually did, and therefore he focuses on seven signs to prove that Jesus is who Jesus said he is. We can find these signs in John 6 to about John 15. Throughout the book of John, we see this dance between the statements of Jesus about what he made about himself and then his actions, the signs he presented. You can find that in John 2 to about 11. I say presented because the word performed feels like he didn't. He did it for attention and that was not his purpose at all. Through this, Jesus reveals who he is and his father's glory. John uses the I am statements by Jesus also to point to Jesus as the Son of God, our Messiah. These statements are, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the true vine. These statements correlates with the Old Testament when God revealed God's self as I am. When Moses asked who he should say to the Israelites had sent him in Exodus 3, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. In the Old Testament, God revealed God's self to God's people and came to save them out of exile in Egypt into a new life in the promised land. Their journey then began and God made a covenant with God's people which required a strict obedience to the laws. Part of the laws was about observing important rituals such as ceremonial cleansing, washing, and of course to choose a lamb without blemish to be sacrificed for the atonement of sins of the people. This is the Old Covenant. With this in mind, Let's take a closer look at our scripture reading for today and dissect it. Verse 1, it reads, On the day, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Commentaries say, It is possible that it was the wedding of a close friend or a family member of Jesus. We also know that Jesus' brothers were there because later in the book of John, they travel with him to Capernaum. So the likelihood that this wedding was for a close relative is a reasonable assumption. Verse 2. 
When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. This also seems to indicate that Mary, Jesus' mother, might have been involved in organizing the wedding. Because of how she knew, how did she know, knew that there was no more wine left? We don't know if Mary wanted Jesus to do anything about it. But it really comes across as if Mary is asking Jesus to save the embarrassing situation. You know that moment when your mom gives you the look and you know exactly what she means? This might as well have been such a moment for Jesus. Next verse. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. What a strange thing to say. Jesus addresses his mom as woman, and it is as if he has no attachment to her and places some distance between them. He seems to have separated himself from his family as his public ministry progresses. We read this in Matthew 12. It says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are outside, wanting to speak to you. He replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to the disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We can ask the question, why is Jesus acting this way toward his family? Was Jesus simply focused on doing the will of his heavenly father? He knew exactly who he was and therefore was grounded and anchored in his heavenly father rather than any other relationship. We know that he loved his family because on the cross, he made sure that his mother was taken care of by John. He said, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. But what did he mean? His hour has not come yet. We now know that his mother wanted to save him or fix the situation. This puzzles me. But I came across John 12, and this is like fast forward three years, and this passage was set in Jerusalem during the Holy Week before Passover. It reads, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls on the ground, and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Wait, what? Jesus used the same words three years apart? We can therefore make a link. Jesus was referring to the hour of his death and then the resurrection for the glorification of God the Father to save the world through the forgiveness of sin. If he performed this miracle, turning water into wine, his cover would be blown 
And the plan that God had for Jesus would be revealed. His identity will be known. We know that at this point, Jesus only had five disciples with him. He hadn't even called all the disciples to follow him yet. Jesus knew that if he did this miracle, the word would spread. And this miracle was, will set this plan of God in motion. Next verse. His mother said to the servant, do whatever he tells you. Mary simply brushed off Jesus' apprehension just by instructing the servants to attend to him. She obviously believed in his power and authority to do something about the situa situation right there and then. She probably didn't understand what Jesus meant when he said his hour has not yet come. Her focus was on the current situation. Their concerns are different. Mary wanted more wine so that the wedding feast can continue without the embarrassment of the poor groom. But Jesus was focused on what he came into this world to do. Mary did not know whether Jesus was in fact going to do something or not, but she knew that Jesus knew best. Whatever he does or does not do, it will work out just like the situation requires. Now that is trust. We continue to verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now this is where things get really interesting. From the time of Leviticus, the Jews loved their rituals. They loved the law and believed because of all their rituals and their covenant that God gave to Moses a long time before. The stone jars were very important because they were not subjected to the impurity laws explained in Leviticus 11. But what caught my eye was that these jars were simply empty. Surely people would still wash their hands throughout the duration of the wedding. The old wine is finished, consumed, gone, and the ritualistic pots were also empty. So no cleansing and purifying could be done. Do these pots symbolize the Judaism of Jesus' day, which had turned into a dead religion? rather than a relationship. It became all about the ritual. Did they love the rituals more than they loved God? The wedding party needed help. They couldn't find more wine on their own and the feast would probably have stopped if the wine ran out. Mary knew that Jesus could save the situation and so she turned to him in faith, asking him to sort it out. She had a relationship with him. She knew him. She knew who he was and therefore believed. Faith was important here. Even Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 17 verse 20, in a very different context, but the principle is the same. He said, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Let's continue to verse 7. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. So just like that, after Jesus told his mother it was not his time, he did what she indirectly had asked. Jesus gave the servants a task to do, and they did it. They were obedient, possibly hoping for the best here. Imagine if they didn't fill the jars. There would not have been more wine. Their servanthood and obedience kept the sign, the miracle, in motion. John pertinently tells us they filled the pots to the brim. These were huge pots. Each pot 
could hold 30 gallons. Then there would have been approximately 680 litres of water altogether. Verse 8. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Again, Jesus gave the servants a task to do. If the servants left the jars of water just sitting there, believing they would embarrass themselves by going to the master of the banquet with water, the miracle would not have been known. Verse 9, they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it came from, though the servants knew who had drawn the water. Verse 10, then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Remember we worked out how many liters of water the stone jars held. So in modern 750 bottles of wine, it would have been 906 bottles. Goeie that's a lot. Now that is abundance. And not just abundance in quantity, but also quality. The wine was great, but better than any award-winning wine farm in South Africa could produce. Jesus controlled nature, the very place he created. He could recreate, change, and so on. Jesus wants to give us good gifts. He tells us this in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Do we trust that the Lord wants to give us good gifts? Jesus taught that we should seek him in prayer because that is the way we get to know him and trust him. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes further to teach us that we should Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. We can therefore seek his kingdom and trust that he has our best interests at heart. Jesus said we will have trouble in this world. Look at the trouble he had in this world when he was crucified. But we know how that story turned out. <laughs> He was raised from the dead and defeating sin forever. Let's continue to our last verse, verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now this is the part of the message I was really looking forward to. Remember when the wine ran out and the ceremonial pots were empty? The wedding needed wine. Jesus chose the old ceremonial cleansing pots, which represent the old covenant with Moses, the law and the rituals, and filled it with new wine. The old wine which ran out represents the end of the animal sacrificial ritual. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, For the life of a creature is in its blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The new wine represents the blood of Jesus. We know this represents his blood when Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper in Matthew 26. He said, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. 
this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it with you in the, my Father's kingdom. Jesus did not replace the ceremonial parts or create something new. The old covenant, the law, he simply came to fulfill. Matthew 5 verses 17 says, <clears throat> Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to, I didn't come to abolish them, but fulfill them. We just read that at the Last Supper on the evening, he was arrested. And before they crucified him, Jesus instituted a new covenant in his blood. The whole wedding feast seems like a parallel of the story of humankind. We cannot do things on our own, in our own strength. We have tried that. The Old Testament testifies to this. We need Jesus, our Messiah, to save us. Just a footnote before we close. Wine is also a representation and a symbol of joy. We read this in the Psalms and in Judges. We find our joy in Jesus and he is no spoils board. We can see that when he supplies 906 bottles of wine to a wedding feast. Think about this story in your own life, where you are currently struggling, vulnerable, or dealing with something difficult, or unsure of the future. Maybe there's a positive job prospect, or a goal, or a dream, but you are afraid it won't happen. How does this sign in today's scripture reading relate to your own life? Do you turn to Jesus and ask him, to guide you, or are you trying to do things in your own strength? Maybe there's a lesson to learn from how Mary and the servants handled the situation. Mary believed in Jesus. She trusted him, and the servants obeyed his instruction without question. What if Jesus told us something we didn't want to hear? Like when we applied for that position and we didn't get it, or when we get a diagnosis from the doctor. What is your response to him? Let's give a moment to think about this this morning. Amen.